Okay, welcome back. Uh, for a minute there, I thought I was going to be here by myself. <laughs> anyway, I hope everyone had a good, uh, good little spring break. Get ready to get back into the things. We're halfway done. Uh, what I want to do first is kind of share with you the schedule. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Okay. Right here. I'm sure you've seen it, but I just want to go over that a little. Go over it a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> okay, what well, we have today is the 22nd. Obviously, there's homework number seven yesterday. Tomorrow's homework number uh, eight. Uh, this Friday's lab is called the Conductivity Lab. And then, uh, no, I think that's incorrect. I need to verify that. I think, I think everything got moved up. Yeah, we did the conductivity already. Uh, it's probably number seven. We'll move up. We can read this some changes there. I'll, I'll verify that. Uh, next Wednesday is the next exam number three, which covers chapter seven through nine. Obviously, we're not done with nine. I will cover that, finish it up today. Okay. Um, I mean, that's about it. Any questions at this point? Before I jump into number nine. I had a question about the nomenclature test. Yes. Um, I still haven't hit an 80. I was below an 80, but it got, are you resetting it to a zero every time if it's not at an 80? Is it right. Be a zero? It, it gets reset back to the zero once. What I do is I go through in all, all the attempts. And I look to make sure you got proper credit and you may see through your attempts that your previous score may have been jumped up. I also attempt to leave notes in there uh, about why an answer was incorrect. And then, uh, it, then it gets reset back to 80 because if you recall the, the departmental uh, policy requires you to get at least an 80 as a passing grade minimum. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there are some points about the nomenclature. Looking at the, the examples, uh, well, number one, uh, don't forget, let me call that up again. Uh, here we go. Don't forget to utilize the study mate. Okay, the study mate. It's over here on the far left side under assignments. It may look a little bit different than yours, but let's what, let's let's get into the student view. So it, this is what you see. Mine's obviously quite different. But down here at the bottom left corner is a study mate. If you click on that, uh, <clears throat> the following workspace is created, and then uh, just continue. You know, you, show, you can say don't show this page again. It's just gives you information about study mate and continue to study mate. And then you'll see in the upper left, up on top in the left here, you'll see a link called nomenclature practice. Clicking that, okay, gives you, gives you, into, it sets you into a new um, uh, tab. And I recommend what it is, I've uploaded about 143-ish compound names and formulas into this uh, program. And um, uh, with this, it helps you to uh, study. For example, if you select flashcards, this is a reminder how this works, is uh, there's 143 flashcards in here. <coughs> Excuse me. In this example, this gives you the name of the compound, uh, lead, Roman numeral four, carbonate. And with that information, you try to figure out what the formula is. Once you do that, you flip the card and the formula is given to you in the back. Keep in mind that uh, this program doesn't support subscripts. So you can see in parentheses that two really would be a subscript and so would that three, okay? And then you move on to the next. And again here, 
you're given lead four chloride and then you go through the process of figuring out, figure out what the formula is and then the formula is given to you, okay? So that's one that's using the flashcard. The other one, which I recommend, I don't recommend the others because the others don't support hyphens and, and parentheses very well. And it gets, it may get a little confusing for you, but for sure I, I ran through flashcards and matching and they function very well with the compounds that I've uploaded. So you select matching here, what you have is the name is given. And then from the name, try to figure out what the formulas have multiple choices. So you got lead to chloride, and you know, you go through it, figure out, I must be that one. There it is, it tells you that it's correct. Uh, if you select the wrong one, it'll tell you, nope, incorrect. Okay, you can reset it. Start again from the beginning, and you know, bromo tribromide, boron tribromide, excuse me, and so forth. So these are our aids for you to help you uh, with respect to the nomenclature uh, requirement. Okay. Uh, the other thing I, I uh, reset, I noticed in some of the answers, and let's, and that is with respect to um, the naming. And then for that, let me call out my periodic table, which I have marked as follows. Now, if you recall, <coughs> A lot of the metals, a lot of them have variable oxidation numbers, okay? Uh, for example, uh, copper, copper could be a copper plus one or a copper plus two, okay? With these variable oxidation numbers, we have to utilize Roman numerals to distinguish the difference between oxidation plus one and oxidation plus two. And so if we were naming, say, uh, this compound, okay, we first have to determine, notice that we're using copper here. Now, there are 16 metals, 16 metals that have an exact constant oxidation number. And these are the ones that are highlighted. From lithium down to FR, and then the next group, there's 12 there. And then the following four, aluminum, zinc, silver, and, and uh, cadmium. And there's the respective charge that they have 100% of the time. So therefore, those 16 do not require Roman numerals because their oxidation number is exact. No question about it. That means that all the other metals that you utilize that are in here, all of them, whatever it may be, okay, require Roman numerals if they're making a compound. So <clears throat> the other aspect to remember is when you combine them with the compounds you combine, specifically the ionic compounds, that you have enough cations and enough anions to equal zero to cancel each other out. So the number, uh, I'm going to have space here, the number of cations plus the number of anions will, must equal zero for 90%, 99% of the compounds you're working with, unless you're working for these polyatomic ions here. And then that zero becomes whatever charge that polyatomic ion is, okay? You'll always know the oxidation number of one, either the anion or the cation. So in this scenario, we have CuCl. We know that the name, the base name is copper chloride, okay? But we also know because copper is not part of the 16, that there is a, a Roman number number that goes there. And then we got the chloride. So we've got Cl2, oh, excuse me, chloride, okay? So that is the base name of that compound. What we need to do now is to determine what that oxidation number is of copper. 
And since we don't know it, we will know the oxidation number of the chloride because chlorides are in this group here. And all the halogens, when they become anions, end up with a negative one charge. So fluorine becomes fluoride with a negative one, chlorine becomes chloride, etc. Everybody in group six will have a negative two charge because they require two electrons to get that magical eight number to get the octet. So oxygen becomes oxide with a negative two, sulfur becomes sulfide with a negative two, etc. And then in group three, these atoms become a, a oxidation number of a negative three. So nitrogen becomes nitride, phosphorus is phosphide, okay? <clears throat> Here, we're using chloride. So chloride has a negative one. So that tells me I got a negative one here for chloride, and I have to have a number that cancels that negative one. So obviously that number has to be a plus one. Copper in this oxidation state must be a plus one to cancel the negative one of copper. Therefore, the name of this compound would be copper Roman numeral one chloride, okay? And we would do that with, you know, the anion is the, the nitride oxide or uh, phosphide, but also, you know, it could have been the nitrate. You could have, you could use any of these polyatomic ions that have a set oxidation number. It could have been copper nitrate, okay? And again, we, need, we go through the same scenario what we just did with the chloride, because we know that the nitrate has a negative one. That implies that copper must be a plus one, okay? So that's this the important part to remember about <coughs> the use of Roman numeral one versus, of the Roman numerals versus no, non, no Roman numerals. The other aspect is the prefixes, okay? I've seen some, some examples that, uh, where is it? Uh, prefixes are utilized, okay? So we, we, we make it very, it's very straightforward. Ionic compounds, all ionic compounds, okay? No prefixes, no prefixes. So for example, if we're given MgCl2, this would be, be would be magnesium. Now we don't use Roman numerals because this is one of the metals that have a fixed oxidation number, so no Roman numerals are needed here. And then chloride. Okay, we wouldn't call this dichloride. because it's an ionic compound and we simply call it chloride, okay? The only time we do use prefixes is when we are dealing with covalent compounds. So it's yes on prefixes. And the classic example are these two here, CO2 and CO. CO2 is carbon dioxide and CO is carbon monoxide. Okay, so yes on prefixes for covalent compounds, no on prefixes for ionic compounds. Okay, now with respect to the names of the corresponding anion, be it ionic or covalent, it, the name remains the same. So oxygen, which becomes, you know, oxide, that name, oxide, is utilized whether it's an ionic compound or a covalent compound, hence carbon dioxide, like, or magnesium oxide, okay? All right. Uh, those are the main things I've been noticing in, in the... the the attempts I've seen is the use of prefixes for ionic compounds and the use or non-use of, of Roman numerals. Okay.
Any any other questions? Let me reset my. All right, then. Well, let me continue with chapter nine. Well, not quite. Giving me trouble here. <laughs> there we go. Chapter nine. We are dealing with acids and bases. Okay. Now we're familiar with acids. Acids are all around us, you know, specifically, they're all rather not only around us, but they're in us. A, a very well-known acid is the stomach acid, which is a uh, called hydrochloric acid, okay? And then we're gonna talk about bases and, and with respect to bases, uh, we are only dealing with the um, the hydroxide ion. So if we come over here to our polyatomic ion table, this polyatomic ion on the corner, the hydroxide, which is OH with a negative charge, that is any compound that produces that is classified a as a base. Okay. And I, I'll give more specific examples here in, in a minute. So, but let me talk about hydrogen for, for first. Okay. We know that hydrogen, the lowest dot structure for hydrogen is just simply H with the one dot because hydrogen has one electron. It's the very first element, one valence electron, <clears throat> okay? And if we look at the electron configuration for hydrogen, it's simply 1s1, okay? Now, if you, if you see where hydrogen is on the periodic table, okay, you'll see that it's in group one. And it is placed in group one because it shares the, the property of all of the other elements that everybody there, let me zoom it up a little bit. Everybody here has one valence electron. Everybody in group one obviously has one valence electron. Yes, they all differ in the total number of electrons because, you know, all the way from hydrogen being the first element with one electron, all the way down to F hard, that contains 87 electrons. But even with 87, there's only going to be one in the outermost shell, in the valence shell, one electron. And they all will react very similarly. All of the metals that I underlined from lithium on down will lose electrons because that's, that is the property of metals to lose electron. And they're going to lose that one valence electron to give you an over, overall new oxidation number of a plus one for the ion. Well, the same is true for hydrogen. Okay, Hydrogen can lose uh, its valence electron. Back here, and so we have hydrogen. When it loses that valence electron, now it now has a plus charge, and that electron configuration now that one valence electron is lost. We produce hydrogen with a plus sign, okay, and we even give it a specific name. So hydrogen with a plus oxidation number is called a proton, okay. <clears throat> and that it's I note here that because the ability of the S orbitals to handle two electrons, hydrogen can also gain an electron, okay? Because it has room for it. And when it does gain an electron, it now has a negative charge. And what happens is when it has a negative charge because it gained an electron, because it has room for it in the S orbital, 
its name gets changed to hydride. Very analogous to the halogens where you got chlorine go chloride. And in fact, the uh, some uh, periodic tables actually put hydrogen not only on group one, but they also place them. Oh, where do you go? They also place it right above here because of that capability of hydrogen to either lose that one valence electron or pick up a valence electron to make it isoelectronic helium and to produce the hydride uh, uh, functionality of, of, the, of hydrogen. So very unique property of hydrogen, but we're gonna focus on the H plus, okay? The H plus, because that is called a proton and that is what is, is responsible for the acidity of a solution as responsible for what makes something an acid, all right? And so we produce a proton and the thing about acids is obviously, you know, a lot of the acids, you know, uh, lemon juice, uh, acetic acid or vinegar, very sour in flavor, okay? Um, they're very corrosive, acids can be very corrosive and react with metals. And the one way to test to see if you have an acid solution is we utilize what's called, what is called a litmus paper test. Strip of paper, uh, it's blue color. And if the solution that you immerse that paper in uh, changes color to red, it simply tells you that it is an acidic solution. Okay, it doesn't tell you the extent of acidity because there are extents of acidity. There are some that are very acid, very strong, and then some that are weaker acids. So we're gonna talk about those, okay? So the thing about the acids is they all come from covalent compounds. Way back, uh, um, I talked about ionic compounds versus uh, covalent compounds when we place them in solution of water, okay? So if we have an ionic compound, okay, so we have a combination of a metal and an X, B, and non-metal. When we place them in solution, like water, they will dissociate, they will break up into the respective ions. And I'm just gonna put a, a a plus here to represent that the metal hell has a plus charge. That plus charge can vary depending on which metal you're using. And then the X represents the anion, which will have a negative charge, which again can vary depending on the oxidation number, you know, negative three, negative two, negative one, et cetera. But the point is that they break apart, okay? Now, a lot of the ionic compounds will break up apart, break apart, dissociate 100% totally, 100% totally dissociated. Classic example of this would be sodium chloride. And this is related to the solubility of that ionic compound in water, of which we have a table that we're gonna talk about whether something is insoluble or not in water. The others though, even though they are classified, the other ionic compounds that are, they are classified as insoluble, they will still leave some ions in solution and maybe they will only dissociate maybe one to 5%, okay? So meaning that the bulk of the material will, be, will remain intact in this form with a few ions in solution, unless it's very soluble. So soluble would be literally 100%, literally in a close thread, and there, nothing is ever 100%. And if it's classified as insoluble, Yes, the bulk of it would be a solid, but there will be a small percentage of it that goes in solution, okay? Now, that is the, the property of ionic compounds. With respect to covalent compounds, okay, when I take a covalent compound of which, let's say I got a combination of a, a, a two nonmetals and M, 
bonded together, NM bonded together, and I place them in water, they do not dissociate, okay? They remain intact. They just may dissolve the in solution, but nothing is broken up. No ions are created, okay, for covalent compounds with one exception. And that is acids. Acids can be denoted with what's, what's normally written 99% of the time you got hydrogen written first. And here I'm just gonna call it X, whatever the other part will be, okay? Of this covalent compound, okay? Which happens to be an acid, that's important. It's gotta be classified as an acid. And when that breaks down, dissociates and dissociates in water, it will create a proton, okay? Plus whatever the corresponding X material is. It will be a salt. A lot of these you're familiar with, the polyatomic ions. If you look at the sulfate, the sulfite, the phosphate, those particular ions, they initially, initially were acids and they got reacted with a base, and we're gonna have more in that in a bit, okay? So <laughs> that is the only exception of covalent compounds, covalent compounds that will dissociate and break apart in water. Now, the same holds true with the extent of how much they break up. Some of these acids will, be, will dissolve 100%, okay, just like I wrote right here, and it applies here. Some acids will dissociate close to 100% and are classified as very strong acids. And then you have other acids that are weak that do not dissociate completely, but they're still acidic and they still make ions. And a good example of that would be vinegar, okay? For example, the, the stomach in the... Uh, uh, the stomach in our, excuse me, the acid in our stomach is a very hot, uh, strong acid, strong acid, and it is um, dissociates 100%. Whereas Italian dressing, vinegar, <laughs> not so much, not 100%. The majority of it remains intact, but more on that in a bit. Okay. All right, let's go back to this. So, so any, any material, any compound that produces a proton is classified by one of the definitions. We're going to have two definitions by two different groups is classified as a, an acid, okay? Those two definitions, are they share the fact that protons are involved. Where they differ is bases, okay? Now, with bases, any compound that when put in solution dissociates to produce a hydroxide ion is classified as a base. And so we could have a metal hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, any metal hydroxide, all right? We put it in water. We're gonna end up with a metal plus charge, okay? and plus the hydroxide. This is what makes a, this is what makes a compound a base. It produces a hydroxide. Now, take note here. The bases generally start up with ionic compounds. Acids come from covalent compounds. Bases come from, um, at least the ones that produce hydroxide come from ionic compounds. <clears throat> now, we'll learn that there was a limitation with this definition because there are other compounds that have nothing to do with hydroxide but can act as a base, okay? More on that in a little bit. So, thing about uh, sodium hydroxide, I wouldn't taste them, but they are bitter. Okay, chalky if in, in solid form. Uh, if you get them on your finger, they feel uh, slimy, 
And that is because the hydroxide is actually denaturing and breaking down your skin, breaking it down. And then that's what's why it's so slimy. In fact, a lot of the cleansers, you know, makeup preps and stuff for your skin, you know, some of these things that are used to, to get rid of layers, they're, they, they're slightly uh, uh, alkaline in solution because they, that tends to help remove the skin tissue a little, bit, a little more um, easier. All right, so with respect to litmus paper, not only do we have blue litmus paper, we also have red litmus paper. And if you have an, a base solution, okay, and it changes to the color blue, then you have a basic solution, a solution that has a base. Okay, now I, an example of an acid is given here is we have an ionic, excuse me, covalent compound, specifically hydrochloric acid, okay? We put it in water and it dissociates, okay? Like I showed earlier. In this scenario, we produce the H plus, which is the proton and the corresponding anion, in this case, the chloride, okay? With respect to a base, specifically, let me, let me clarify this. As I said earlier, there's two definitions. One is called an arrhenius acid or an arrhenius base. Now, an arrhenius acid produces a proton. An arrhenius base, when put in solution, produces the hydroxide ion. Okay, So that was the initial definition of an acid of a base, something that produces a proton something that produces a hydroxide respectively, okay? Um, covalent compounds, and if you notice HCl is a covalent compound, produce a acid. Whereas ionic compounds, in this scenario, for arrhenius base, uh, arrhenius bases come from ionic compounds, okay? Now, This is one of your first type of reactions we're going to talk about. We're going to eventually talk about six of them, not this chapter, but a preceding chapter. And there's six types of chemical reactions. Here's your first one. This is called a neutralization reaction. This is what happens is when you react an acid with a base. The result is you form a salt, if shown by that general reaction on top, and water. So you think about it, you know, you have a, you just ate, ate something and you got a little bit of a heartburn, you know, what do we take? We take some Tums, for example, and it helps alleviate the, the heartburn, okay? Because the heartburn comes from the, maybe the overproduction of acid in your stomach, okay? Well, as you ingest the Tums, it has a base, it tends to react with, it will react with the acid in your stomach and reducing the acid content a little bit to help you know alleviate the problem of the acid reflux. Okay. And that the the general the general reaction occurring there is very straightforward. It is a proton plus the hydroxide come together and form. H2O one. Okay. Now let me let me break it down as far as you know what's going on here. Now remember the proton had that 1s orbital that was empty. It lost its electron, so the 1s orbital is empty. And it doesn't mean the orbital is not no, not there, it's just is there, it's just empty. Whereas the hydroxide, if we do the Lewis dot structure for the hydroxide. We had the bond between oxygen and hydrogen, but then we have three pairs of unbonded electrons around the hydroxide, okay? And here comes the proton with that empty orbital. And so in effect, it can take a pair of the hydroxide ions, okay? 
those pair of hydroxide ions can literally insert into the orbital of that hydrogen, that proton that has empty electrons and generate that bond right there. And hence you have H2O. So the acid and the base react to neutralize each other and the product that you get is water, okay? So here we have hydrochloric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide. Keep in mind, hydrochloric acid will have the proton. Sodium hydroxide will produce the hydroxide. Those two get together and generate water, just like I showed you up here. And then you have the corresponding salt. You have the the cation of the base and the anion of the acid combined to give you sodium chloride. Okay, so that is that is the, the uh, neutralization reaction. Acid in the base come together, and you generate a salt. Now you may be thinking in this example, you know, we think of salt as you know sodium chloride, what we put it in French fries. But keep in mind, in chemistry, the term salt encompasses any ionic compound, okay? Because we use sodium hydroxide here, but we could have used potassium hydroxide or any other base, any other hydroxide, okay? And it produces a different salt, which is an ionic compound. Okay, the other takeaway here is this. Notice that my reaction says, it's understood that I got a one in front of them, the coefficient of one. One proton requires one hydroxide to react to produce one water. Okay. So if I have two protons, I need two hydroxides to neutralize those two protons, which then give me two waters. If I have a thousand protons, I need a thousand hydroxides, and they will give me at the end a thousand waters when they neutralize each other, okay? That is something we call stoichiometry, and that, that is the reaction ratio of reactants, A and B coming together at a certain ratio. A lot of times it's a simple one-to-one, -one, but there will be times we're going to talk about that. this, is you can get a two-to-one, three-to-one, any, any combination, okay? But you got to have the exact ratio so that you can neutralize each other. So in this case, it's a pretty straightforward one-to-one -one ratio. One proton for every one hydroxide to give me one water. All right. So this is an example of a neutralization reaction. We are neutralizing the acid and the base to generate water and a salt. You, know, you can try this at home. You know, you can take a little bit of uh, of uh, vinegar okay you can take a little bit of vinegar and some uh, baking soda okay which is acetic acid and sodium bicarb and it they will react and you're going to get a lot of buzz buzzling and fizzing and that's okay that is carbon dioxide that's the baking soda reacting with the acid breaking down to generate carbon dioxide. Uh, that would be uh, carbon dioxide plus water plus the salt. And uh, you can try this, like I said, at home, you see a bub bubbling going on. So anytime you have an acid spill, any place in your home, or like if you were, <laughs> you're working on your battery and there's acid spill, uh, just take a little baking soda, dump it on there and you'll neutralize that acid. It'll look kind of crazy with all that bubbling action, but just keep in mind that is just simply carbon dioxide coming up. Okay. All right. Now, up to this point, the Bronsted Lowry definition required that the hydroxide be involved with respect to being an arrhenius base. And that kind of limited you to the type of bases you can work with, you know, only ionic compounds that will produce a hydroxide 
could be classified as a base. But it turns out that there are other compounds that have nothing to do at all with the hydroxide that can neutralize and react with an acid, a protons. Okay. And, and those turn out to be, well, what happened is, is the, the two scientists here, Brownstein and Lowry, entered, introduced a new definition of a base. Uh, the definition for an acid is basically the same. I think they're just semantics the way they stated. But uh, for a brownstead Lowry acid, you have uh, something that loses a proton, is classified as an acid. That's the same thing as Ar Arrhenius definition. And that's something that, you know, produces a proton. Okay. So lose or produce, you're making a proton. They're both an acid. So Bronson and Lowry share that definition. Where they differ in the two definitions is how Bronson and Lowry defines a base. And Bronson and uh, Bronson Lowry says that a base is any chemical that will accept that proton. Okay, but in order to accept that proton, as I explained earlier, with the the, the proton and hydroxide coming together, and then there was an empty orbital of the proton and it shared uh, the electrons from the hydroxide to form that bond. Well, the same is true here, except there's no hydroxide. What it is, is um, compounds, specifically these nitrogen-based compounds that contain lone pair, but it could be any compound that has a lone pair. Recall we did the Lewis dot structure for ammonia. And we came up, came up with this, and it had a lone pair on the central atom. Okay, very analogous to the hydroxide I just was talking about. Okay, so then we could we get the proton coming from HCl. Okay, it will create. Those long, that lone pair can then attach itself to that empty orbital of the proton, just like we just talked about earlier with respect to uh, hydroxide. We will get that lone pair and create a bond to make H water. However, in this case, it doesn't create water. It just creates a polyatomic ion that you're familiar with, if you look at the polyatomic ion table, you'll find the only positive charged one is the ammonium ion. And you have, and we also did the Lewis dot structure for this. And now that proton is flowing freely, is now tied up with that lone pair of the nitrogen to form this polyatomic ion called the ammonium ion. And then the counter anion, which is the chloride out here. So that would be ammonium chloride. The net effect is the same, whether it be hydroxide or a, a proton acceptor, is that that acid gets neutralized. Okay. But now it encompasses other compounds that can be classified as bases and have nothing to do with hydroxide. Okay, even here, the hydroxide is the a proton acceptor and accepted that proton to neutralize that proton to form water, okay, which is what's happening in the equation given there. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. All right, so the HCl gain, loses the, the proton, which is the acid, the brownstein lowry acid, and the ammonia gains a proton, which it makes it the brownstein lowry base, okay? Uh, if, if we were dealing, and here's, here's the important difference between the two. If we were dealing with HCl and sodium hydroxide, okay? We will form sodium chloride, which is a salt plus water. Okay. This is the Arrhenius, Arrhenius acid. I just call it AA, Arrhenius acid. And this is the Arrhenius base. I'll call it AB. Okay. 
because the arrhenius base produces hydroxide. That's the key between the difference between the two. Okay. All right. Now, with respect to how do we classify strong acids, how do we classify strong bases? It's it, it it is nothing more than the the extent of dissociation that these acids go into solution. If they go into solution 100%, it is classified a strong acid. If they go into solution much less than 100%, you know, like less than 10% or so, then it's called a weak acid. The same is true for the base. It's just the extent of solubility in an aqueous system. And I, I say the term 100%, but you know, keep in mind that nothing's really 100%, okay? So here's an example of three strong acids. No, all of them are covalent compounds. Now, also the other way you might, the other thing is you might say, well, how do I know it's an acid? Well, nine times out of 10, hydrogen is written first in the formula. Okay, that's a fairly good indication that you're dealing dealing with an acid. Okay, now after hydrogen, if you recognize that you have a polyatomic uh, ion that confirms that in fact you are dealing with an acid. For example, let's take uh, this one here. Okay, we have the hydrogen. You might think, okay, I think I got an acid. But then I look over here and I got NO3. Well, if you look at NO3, doesn't that look familiar? You look at the polyatomic ion table, that is the nitrate ion, polyatomic ion. The difference between these two is that the nitrate has lost its hydrogen because the, the, this acid reacted with the base, neutralized the proton, to form the salt, specifically the nitrate salt, okay? If you look at this one, you got H2SO4. Again, we look at the fact that you see hydrogens up front, which say, oh, I think I got an acid. Then I come back and I see SO4 that looks familiar. Yeah, it does. I, I check my polyatomic ion table, and sure enough, this is the sulfate. Okay. The point being that a lot of these polyatomic ions in the, on the uh, table, the anions, the negative ones, were at one point the acid. The nitrate came from this acid, HNO3, which has a specific name called nitric acid. Okay. The H2SO4, is an acid called sulfuric acid. And then we're familiar with HCl, hydrochloric acid. <clears throat> and so you'll, normally you'll see a hydrogen followed by an halogen or, and or a polyatomic ion after the hydrogen. And that's a good indication that you that you are working with an an acid here. Okay, to help you out. Because if you look at say, sometimes you see H4C, you might think, oh god, yeah, maybe I got hydrogen here. But then now you see is carbon. You know, carbon hydrogen, that's a hydrocarbon. It doesn't even come near. You know, same is true for H2O by different by convention. H2O is written in that manner, hydrogen first, and it's not really an acid. What's the only thing that follows there is oxygen just all by itself, so it's not an acid. Unlike the acids we're gonna work with are followed by these species that you, hopefully you recognize from the polyatomic ion team. And then these single halogens um, like HCl, HPr, all the halogens are all acidic when they're combined with hydrogen. All right. So uh, the point here being strong is that all these three will dissociate completely into um, 
hundred percent HCl. And now we'll get the names in a second. But the second one is called nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Now, with respect to strong bases, okay. And when we talk about bases, uh, we're going to just kind of uh, focus on the ionic bases, which is the Arrhenius definition of a base. Okay. And those are the compounds that are ionic and uh, uh, will produce hydroxide. Okay. Now here we, we show you two of them that are strong bases. They dissolve completely in water. Now how do we know that? Okay, how do we know that these are strong bases? Well, let me let me elaborate on this just a little bit more because we're gonna we are going to use this table much more later on. Okay, now if you look at your periodic table in the bottom right corner, you will see another table labeled solubility rules right here. Okay, now there are two columns here. We have this column right here, which is the soluble column. And then we have this column right here, which is the insoluble column. We're gonna work on the soluble co column. If you look at number one of the soluble column, you see the, the four ions, lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium, okay? What that means is this, when you see any ionic compound where the metal is either lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium ions, okay, those compounds are always 100% of the time soluble. And when they are soluble, that implies that they will dissolve approximately 100%. So everybody in this column being classified as soluble, and we're going to have a lot more to say about the other, but right now just focus on this, okay? that they are roughly 100% soluble. So if I take sodium chloride, table salt, and I put a pinch in it, uh, a little few mil or grams in a gallon of water, it is completely dissociated, 100%, okay? But there's limitations to solubility. Even though if it's classified as soluble, doesn't mean I can take 20 pounds of sodium chloride and try to dissolve it in, you know, uh, two cups of water. It's just not going to happen, okay? Just too much, not enough uh, water here. But yeah, if I take an ocean of water and I dump those 10 pounds, they're going to dissolve, all right? So when it's classified as insoluble, basically what this telling that's really, though, even though it's classified as insoluble, there's going to be a small percentage, maybe one to 5% that's in solution. And the, the rest the rest of it, the, the 95 to 99% still intact and insoluble and falling down precipitating, okay? So lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium attached to anything else will always be soluble, okay? And so we have the hydroxide ion that is attached to these four, okay? It is always soluble. Not only these four, but when you take the hydroxide, normally hydroxide ion is insoluble, regardless of what you put in, partner, partner it with. But like anything else, there's exceptions. If it is partnered with these four, lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium, and or calcium, strontium, or barium, that means there are seven hydroxide compounds that are classified as soluble. That means all the 10,000 billion other hydroxide compounds are insoluble. But the ones that are soluble literally are strong bases. So lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, ammonium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, strontium hydroxide, barium hydroxide are all strong bases because they are classified as being soluble in the aqueous solution, okay? And therefore being classified soluble, literally 100% of it goes into solution. But we're only showing you two of those, okay? 
Okay, but keep that in mind that there's really more than two. So here's sodium hydroxide, AKA uh, lye solution. You may hear that term out there, L-Y-E, is a Grosin solution uh, forming the hydroxide ion and the sodium ion, okay? Literally 100%. Now, if we're going to denote a diagram to demonstrate graphically that we have a strong acid or a strong base, and we use beaker diagrams, they'll be shown as follows. On the left is HCl, which by definition we told you is a strong acid. So literally we would take maybe a, 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 a set of two or three sets, a pair, HCl, and put them in solution. <clears throat> but then I have to break them apart because they dissociate. So you notice here I got three sets of HCl. I got three chlorides and three protons. Okay, and that's a good depiction of a strong acid because none of them are still combined. They're all dissociated. The same is true on the far right. So those seven hydroxides that I mentioned, okay, they will be depicted as follows in the far right, where I put in maybe three or four sets of sodium hydroxide and then show them that they're in solution, all separated, floating in the water. And... Uh, I would uh, make sure I put the charges on the, 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 in the on both the cation and the anion, because what I see a lot of is the people put the the um, uh, just maybe just the sodium and the hydroxide and forget the charge. Well, it, sodium by that, that represents no charge. The sodium element which will react violently <laughs> in the water. And again, if you don't have the hydroxide, I don't know what that is without the charges, okay? So don't forget the charges. And if I, if I have three anions, then I must put three cations, okay? The charges balance themselves out. Notice I have three chloride chlorides here, but then I got three protons. So make sure you put enough of each when you draw this. So these two diagrams depict, represent a strong acid on the left and a strong base on the right. Now, how do you know which, how to draw that? Well, you have to realize that you're dealing with a strong acid and a strong base to make sure you uh, draw them out, totally all of them separated, okay? So those are the three strong acids we had talked about, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, and sulfuric acid. And then the strong bases are uh, sodium hydroxide, uh, potassium hydroxide, but keeping in mind those other ones that we didn't incorporate, they're also strong bases, or seven total, okay? Because they're, very, they're classified as being soluble in, um, water. So again, notice the trend here. Acids are covalent compounds. Bases are ionic compounds that contain the hydroxyl, hydroxyl ion, polyatomic ion. Again, what strong means is essentially the, the extent of uh, dissolving with their corresponding ions. All right, which brings us to what are classified as weak acids and weak bases. So it makes sense. We just talked about being strong that they dissociate 100%. So a strong, a weak acid or a weak base is the extent of dissociation. And anything that is classified as a weak base, they have dissociated much, much less, okay? Maybe one to 5%. And so in this example, we, we give you one, two, three, four different examples, okay? The first one is this one here, hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid. And if you ever do any uh, hobby things like stained glass and stuff, you may have used this in your chemicals because this stains glass very well. And the next one is H2CO3. 
Uh, this is called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid. Notice the CO3 from the carbonate ion. Okay. Uh, once all the, and you get the sodium bicarb that has one hydrogen and one sodium. Uh, but if those three, if those uh, two hydrogens are put back into the carbonate ion, then we have carbonic acid. Okay. <clears throat> um, the next one is if you like Italian dressing, you probably eat a lot of this. Or, or maybe just use vinegar and oil, because this is acetic acid. Acetic acid, aka vinegar. We tend to use the term acetic acid rather than vinegar. And then the next one is uh, phosphoric acid. Again, you find this a lot in soda pops. Okay, but note that, that originally came from the phosphate. Okay, and we put the three hydrogens back in, then you have phosphoric hydrogen. This one, if you look at your polyatomic ion table, this is the acetate, acetate ion. Put the hydrogen back on, then you have acetic acid. This is the CO3 carbonate ion. Put the two hydrogens back on, you have carbonic acid. And this came from the fluoride ion, which you recombine with the hydrogen. Now you have hydrofluoric acid. If this was chloride, it would be hydrochloric acid. If it was bromide, it would be hydrobromic acid, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the, the thing about these compounds is that when you place them in solution, they will dissociate, but do not dissociate completely. And so down here, the ions, depending on the acid, you probably get one to 5% ions. And everything else remains intact. That can vary from, from 95 to 99% is still intact as a unit, okay? And so therefore, um, they're not acidic. There's no acidity here. If we had um, we're going to learn about the pH and so forth. This will have a different pH value because it's a weak acid. It doesn't produce as much protons in solution than a stronger acid that will produce a lot more protons. Okay. All right. Oh, the other thing, because of this, because it doesn't dissociate 100%, the previous examples, we use a one way arrow in our, in our reaction. Okay, one way. Here we use a two-way arrow because that, tell, that tells us that this reaction goes in both directions, forward and backwards. And there's an equilibrium eventually set up where it sets itself at whatever equilibrium it has, depending on the compound. And there's different types of equilibrium depending on what the acid is. <clears throat> and even that has a value, but we're not talking about it here with Chem 130. But you have a two-way arrow to represent a weak acid. Okay. All right. Now, how do we represent that with a diagram? Okay. On the left, we have HF. So the first thing we have to determine is that what is the strength of HF? Well, as we gave you, HF is a weak acid, okay? So that means that the bulk of the material is still intact. Second of all, if you notice that the HFs are the covalent compounds. Well, the covalent compounds, even though um, they're not solids, they will stay in solution, okay? Just like a soda pop. You got a soda pop here, you know, in this liquid, I have carbon dioxide. Not soluble in water because if I do this, I can shake it and all that carbon dioxide comes out. But then eventually it goes back to equilibrium and it comes back in. But the point is that carbon dioxide is still intact inside the liquid. And so the same is true for these acids in covalent form. They are weak and still remain intact. 
Okay, so we represent them as combined. So this HF, 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 that is hydrofluoric acid intact. And we can put, you know, four or five pairs here, sets, okay, to demonstrate that and to demonstrate since they're still intact, no charges. And then we add at least one set of the respective ions, okay? That indicates that we have a weak acid, okay? Because the majority of the majority of the compound is still intact. Because like I said, 95 to 99 percent of it is still intact. and floating around in solution. okay? Now, with respect to the bases, again, it's a it's a factor of insolubility. Okay, here we have magnesium hydroxide, which again the double arrow tells you that it's not it's not a one way street, it's a two way street, so to speak. And so being then infers that it's a weak base, and so what we do is we draw the magnesium hydroxide in the bottom here. And, you know, this wiggly line represents that the bulk of the material is intact and a solid that drops to the bottom of the wire. water. This is an indication of ionic compounds. Unlike the covalent compounds that remain in solution or floating around, ionic compounds that are insoluble in water, they drop. A good example of this would be like um, uh, milk of magnesium, which you drink for upset stomach, you know, acid reflux or something. If you were to take that bottle out and put it in a clear container, eventually it will separate. It'll have a bottom layer, which is kind of cloudy. And that is because it's a magnesium-based material, based like magnesium hydroxide, and it will precipitate down to the bottom of the container. Now, we have to show that it's weak, and we still have to show at least one set of ions in solution. And so we put in here one set, because we know from the formula there's two hydroxides for every magnesium ion. Okay, So we put in a set of ions in solution, just like we did with the weak acid. Okay, And that depicts a, a uh, weak base. And we know it's a weak base because it's a function of solubility. Let's go back to the solubility table. Okay. We have here the hydroxides. Normally, hydroxide ions, you know, they're in the insoluble um, column inside. So all hydroxides are insoluble except these four calcium, magnesium, and strontium. And if we were to, sh if we had am ammonium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide or any of these seven, and we had to make a diagram, they would be completely dissociated in our picture. Okay, that means that all the other combinations are insoluble, and we were working with magnesium hydroxide. Well, magnesium hydroxide is not one of the seven, so that means it's insoluble. But even though it is classified as insoluble, keep in mind there's still a little bit in a little bit of ions in solution. So, magnesium hydroxide, copper hydroxide. Literally all the other metal hydroxides are insoluble, except for those seven that I underlined with red, okay? And once we know that it's insoluble, then when we draw the diagram, we can put it down at the bottom of the container to demonstrate that and then put, it, put in at least one set of ions in solution, okay? Right. <clears throat> the question that's often asked is, all right, with respect to bases, how do I know if it's strong or weak? 
My answer is this. Look at the solubility of the hydroxides. There's only seven hydroxides that are soluble, which make those strong bases. That means any other combination you're given of metal hydroxides are weak because the bulk of it is insoluble, okay? And that is for these ionic arrhenius bases. Uh, for the acids, unfortunately, I can tell there's really no table to look at. You're just going to have to learn the strong and the weak acids. There are three strong acids we gave you, okay? Hydrochloric, nitric, and sulfuric acid. And then there are these four weak acids, hydrofluoric, hydrofluoric carbonic, uh, acidic, and phosphoric acid. Those are the weak acids, okay? And knowing that those are weak, then they will be uh, shown graphically uh, something like on the left. Here we use the HF as an example, but it could have been acetic acid, it could have been carbonic acid or phosphoric acid, okay? All right. Now, those are the weak acids. Okay. And this is one of the weak bases, which is not limited to that, okay? Uh, we just gave you one example here. You have... <laughs> Every metal out there, other than those seven, are weak bases there that are all, every metal that's combined with hydroxide, other than those seven, are weak bases. And that is based purely on the solubility of the hydroxide combined with any metal. Okay. All right. Again, weak represents the extent of, of the material in solution. So you might be given something like this and ask, okay, uh, I got the diagram here, okay? Uh, first of all, they're asking you, what is a strict, strong acid, uh, weak acid, or weak base? Well, let's, let's answer the base, the base question first. Normally, when we talk about a base, we're going to be talking about the Arrhenius base. So that means hydroxide. So do you guys see any hydroxide images in any of the diagrams here, A, B, C, or D? No, there isn't. There's no hydroxide. There's no OH negative. Okay. <clears throat> so how do we know we have an acid solutions in the diagram? How do I recognize that? What is it about these diagrams that tell me I have, I have an acid to work with here? What do you think? Any ideas? Hannah or Ashley? Sorry, I was writing something down. Oh, oh, that's right. I'm sorry, what was the question? Oh, <laughs> the question is, how do you guys know that of these four diagrams, A through D, that you're working with an acid? What is, what is, what's in that image that tells you I'm dealing with an acid? There's positive ions in there? Yeah, which are called... Uh, have it, it starts with the letter P, protons. Oh, yeah. Yeah, protons in solution tell you that you're dealing with an acid. So I got a proton here and here. So A, B, and C, we're dealing with an acid. There's no base here because we're not dealing with any hydroxides. I don't see any hydroxides anywhere. All right. So... <clears throat> That could be the answer for a strong base. We just say no, none. Now, with respect to a strong acid, the only thing I can compare now is A, B, and C. So which one would be the strong acid? A, B, or C? Or all three of them strong acids? What do you guys think? I'd probably say A. Yeah, and, and that why that's correct, but why why would you say that? 
because there's more of the um positive yeah, more of the protons protons yes exactly second of all if you notice in a they all of them are totally dissociated unlike b and c they still are shown to be together that is a good indication that you are dealing with the weak over here so these two are definitely weak acids and this definitely is a strong acid because all of the protons all of the ions are totally 100 percent dissociated okay all right so that means that a is a would indicate a strong acid whereas b and c would indicate a weak acid and obviously no strong base here because we don't see any any hydroxides in solution now let's let's extrapolate it a little bit further if i were to compare simply these two b and c because we all agree that a is a strong acid now which would be stronger b or c why would that be the case or are they both equally strong? What can I conclude simply based on the image? What do you guys think? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the strength of an acid is, is, is determined by the amount of ions in solution. And so A has literally all the ions in solution. So that's a strong acid, okay? So B and C don't have all the ions in solution, but they have ions in solution. They do have protons in solution. Which one of these would have more protons, B or C, based on the drawing? B? B? All right, well, let's count, let's count the number of protons. Let me change the color. For B, we have... One here, and that's it. And for A, uh, A, excuse me, C, so you are correct. And C has one, two, okay? So you can see here that B has more protons in solution than A. So therefore, if I needed to even go further and say of the weak acids, which one is stronger? I would have to conclude that B is stronger because there's more protons in solution based on the diagram that I'm given, okay? And that also, if we had a, a pH meter would also uh, would tell us that uh, B will have a different pH value than C. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about pH here in a second. All right, because here you go. <clears throat> There's a scale, the pH scale. That scale runs from zero to 14, okay? Um, and then uh, seven is defined as neutral. So anything less than seven is in the acidic range. It's an acid solution. And no, anything less than seven is going from zero to six. So there's degrees of acidity. The strong acids are the ones with the low numbers, zero, one, and two, two-ish. Okay, those are strong acids. They have more protons in solution, or literally all of them in solution when they dissolve. The weak acids, like for example, acetic acid or vinegar, they don't have as many protons in solution. So the proton concentration is much less which results in a higher pH value. So uh, vinegar will have roughly around three, a pH value of three, making it a lot less, make it a lot weaker than say hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, uh, maybe about around here, HCl, stomach acid. Uh, vinegar, eh, it could be, uh, acidic acid somewhere in this region, okay? Um, 
If you ever use liquid plumber to unclog your drains at home, so liquid plumber will be in that range here, so it's pH very alkaline. Liquid plumber. Okay. Uh, your your blood pH, very important pH value that maintains just slightly above, slightly about 7.4-ish. Could vary a little bit, but not much. A very important pH that our body must maintain. Okay, so um, what we're going to introduce here is this new uh, name for concentration. Okay, uh, normally concentration is a mass over volume, but we have this concentration that we put a bracket around. So when you see H plus with brackets, that is defined as molarity. And we're going to get in more detail about this down the road, but we're introducing it now, which is basically a concentration, which is which is a ratio, which is a ratio of moles divided by volume in liters. Okay, and we're going to learn how to calculate moles down the road here. <laughs> but once you do that, and you have and you have a uh, volume, you have a concentration of molarity. And what this is saying is this, when the molarity, the concentration of hydrogen, the proton, is greater than the hydroxide, we have an acidic solution, okay? When the concentration of the proton <coughs> or the molarity of the proton is equal to the molarity of the hydroxide, then we have a neutral pH of seven. Then when the hydroxide concentration starts to increase and is much greater than the proton concentration, then we, we get into the realm of a basic solution, aka also known as alkaline. Alkaline solution. Okay. Now Earlier, I showed you that when a proton reacts with a base, do you remember what the product is? This was a neutralization reaction. But if you take an acid and you react with a base, what is the main component that you generate? So if I take if I take a proton and I react it with a hydroxide, I get water. Okay, so proton plus the hydroxide ion gives you water. You have it in in effect neutralize the acidity by reacting the acid with the base, okay? Now, on the market, this is the alkaline, <coughs> alkaline region here. You have uh, waters out there called alkaline water, where their pH is, I don't know, somewhere around here, okay? And they emphasize the health benefits of drinking alkaline water. So I leave it to you to come with a conclusion whether that is a true statement or not. Uh, at this point, I can't, I can't tell you if it is because this is what happens. Your stomach is the proton. You got tons of hydrochloric acid here. The moment you ingest anything that's alkaline, it will get neutralized with the acid to produce water. And so whatever alkaline material you have ingested, it is no longer, it is now uh, neutralized. Okay, so whatever benefits you got from drinking the alkaline water, thinking that the alkalinity gives you health, uh, health benefits, I, I, I don't know, uh, because not only are you going to get water, but you're going to get plus, plus the salts, whatever salts you have in there. Okay, which could be a problem if it's, if it's loaded with sodium and you have, uh, you know, 
issues with heart issue and you got to maintain minimize your sonar intake so yeah something to think about that uh, anyway proton plus hydroxide produces water aka neutralization reaction All right, this, this is a rehash of what I just spoke about. I said that the concentration is given in brackets and is called moles, it has units of moles per liter. And when the concentration of the proton is greater than the hydroxide, it's an acidic solution. Uh, and if it's less than hydroxide, it's basic. And if they're both equal, then it's neutral. Okay, so pure water, pure, pure water uh, is, uh, should be neutral. And if you measure the pH of it, you would get a pH value of seven <clears throat> because there wouldn't be <clears throat> any acid or base in your solution. There may be ions in there, which is a totally different, different thing. Okay, now how do we, how do we uh, calculate the pH of a solution? Well, pH itself is just simply a, a, a mathematical function. It is specifically the negative log of, let me rewrite right that, pH, where for our purposes will always be a positive number of zero, zero to 14, okay? pH is defined as the negative log of the proton concentration, okay? So you type in the concentration of your acid and on your calculator, you hit um, log button, which could be a primary function, okay? And you end up with a negative number. Now, if you multiply negative times a negative, you end up with a positive. So that's why pH value is always from zero to a um, 14 positive values. Yes, you can get numbers that are negative, but uh, again, that's, we're gonna keep it at zero to positive. I also saw something that uh, that's being presented out there <laughs> where you get solutions that are pH 50, 60, 70, which is kind of outrageous, but because a, a lot of instruments cannot even measure that amount. All right, so anyway, if you want to back calculate to determine what the hydrogen concentration is based on the pH, then use this formulation here on the right, which says that um, if you take the hydrogen, you want to calculate what that is. What is your proton concentration? If you take the 10 to the negative pH value. Okay, there is a button on your calculator that says maybe 10 to the X button. Okay, so if you type that and then you type a negative value for the pH you're given, then that gives you the concentration. So you can back calculate given the pH. All right, good. So, fine. When you're using scientific notation and you have one times 10 to whatever X coefficient, we're gonna learn here that the pH is simply whatever the coefficient is. Okay, so, um, one second here. <laughs> My Zoom is acting up. Bear with me for a second. Okay. <laughs> All right. So if we look at a concentration, molarity of one times 10 to the negative fifth, the pH is simply the coefficient, the positive value of that coefficient. So it's simply five, okay? So if you were to, wanted to go the reverse, the reverse direction, you would say 
push the 10 to the x power button, then type in a negative 5, and you would get the answer 1 times 10 to the negative 5. OK? Uh, 1 times 10 to the negative 8, the its pH value would be simply 8. Let me clear up here real quick. OK, now this one, 1 times 10 to the negative third, this pH would be a simply a 3. So a pH of 5, is that acidic, neutral, or alkaline? What do you guys think? Because definitely one is acidic. It'd be acidic. Yeah, it would. Exactly. How about a pH of eight? Basic. Basic. Exactly. And then a three will also be acidic. Remember, seven is neutral. So anything less than seven would be acidic. Anything more than seven would be basic. Uh, here we have point zero zero one. At this point, we can just simply uh, type in that number in your calculator, and let's do it that way. Let me let me type that number in uh, based on my calculator here. I'll share my calculator right here. Clear it up. So if I were to go uh, point zero zero one, and then hit my log button. Okay, notice that I get a negative three. Okay, and the equation is negative log, so I multiply negative three by negative one, and I end up with a, a, a three, pH of three. Okay, or I could have just taken a point zero zero one, converted that to one times 10 to the negative third, and just, I can see that uh, the pH would be three. Now that is true only for one times 10 to whatever exponent. When you get a number that is not the case, uh, then you have to use the calculator. So for example, let's say uh, we wanted to know the, the concentration is, uh, I don't know, 2.45 times 10 to the negative fifth. That's our concentration, and we want to know what the pH is. All right, so we get our calculator. I lost the number I was writing down, so I think it was like uh, 2.54, 10 to the negative fifth. Let's assume that's the number we wanted. I put that in scientific notation, okay? And then hit the log, and my pH is negative 4.59, which I'll just round it out to uh, uh, pH of 4.6 for that value I just plugged in. So when the numbers are not a simple one times 10 to whatever exponent, their actual value like 2.54 times 10 to the fifth, you got to use the log function in your calculator. All right, so uh, some examples of pH values that you may be familiar with. You know, obviously, vomit is <laughs> bad example, but it's an example, OK? Uh, it is pH around 2. That can vary a little bit from person to person, but very acidic. And that's why any regurgitation actually burns your esophagus because the cells in our esophagus are not made to withstand the high P or low pH value of our stomach. Okay. Uh, lemon juice, around, you know, very city, 2.3. Coffee varies from, you know, type of coffee, but it's around five. Your saliva, you know, it's a function of individual, but normally it's pretty close to neutral. Also depends on one's diet and you know other other things. Our blood very important. It must maintain a pH of what seven point four ish. 
um, who have to maintain that uh, for a lot of things in their body to function properly. Milk of magnesia, very alkaline, okay, high basic. That's why we ingest it when we have some acid trouble. We want to neutralize some of the acid. Ammonia, about 11.7. Urine, yeah, that varies from individual, but it's, it's acidic, okay? Most soda pops, you know, from two and a half to three and a half. The root beer, I was kind of surprised. It's a lot more, less acidic than the rest of the soda pops. So anyway, um, so let's change gears just a little bit. Not much, but we're going to change it. We're going to talk about buffers. Now, what buffers are, are chemical, chemicals that we can put together, which are made up of an acid and a base that we put together you know, in a certain manner, a certain way, concentration, so forth, so that we create a buffer. And a classic example of a buffer is the one we have in our body, trying to maintain a 7.4. So our body is trying to maintain that blood uh, pH you know, 24 seven. And it does that with a variety of different chemicals in the blood system and even our breathing is involved with carbon dioxide and so forth. <clears throat> and so if, if your blood becomes too acidic, the buffer system has a base that will react with the acid component coming in to maintain that pH that you want. Or you have an alkaline, uh, too alkaline um, going in your blood, then the acid function reacts with that to, again, maintain that pH. So basically is a buffer is made up of chemicals that will maintain whatever pH you, you want to keep constant, okay? All right, so going back to this reaction, we have this reaction here, okay? And the question is, uh, which is the Arrhenius acid? Which, what do you guys think? We have HNO3 reacting with, see, I won't give the name because that will give, that will tell you what, which one is which. Reacting with CA parentheses OH and parentheses 2 to generate, react and give us uh, water and the salt. Okay. And so, which one of the reactants, you know, when the question's here, they're talking about the reactants. We don't care about the products because it's, the reactions happen. We made new material. So with respect to the reactants, which one is the Arrhenius acid? I'm going to call this A versus B. What do you guys think? Is A the Arrhenius acid or B the Arrhenius acid? Anybody want to give it a shot? Um, B. Okay. Now, how do we identify an acid given the form of Mosa? Remember what I said about how it's normally written 99% of the time? What would you see first with respect to the atom? Which atom would you see first? <clears throat> would, would calcium see first versus H? Which one do you think would be the acid? Keep it in mind, what is the definition of an acid, or heinous acid? It must produce this, right? So what is the likelihood of calcium producing a proton? Versus hydrogen producing a proton? Who's so, more hey. Exactly. And, and the thing to, to look for when you see the formula is if H is first, 
Okay, nine times out of 10, you're working with an acid. Okay, and then to further, to further help you out to identify, see what follows the H. Well, if you see the H, you see that you got nitrogen followed by three hydrogen oxygens. And that should say, I recognize that. That looks like the nitrate ion. Okay, because guess, guess what? You're going to make it over here, the nitrate. Okay, so that in itself, once you see you, you recognize that you're dealing with the nitrate ion, that would indicate that and the hydrogen that you're dealing with the acid here. Okay. Now, with respect to the other side, the base, the fact that you see a parenthesis and in the parenthesis you have the OH. That in itself, automatically, that's the base. Okay. So in this scenario, well, Nitric acid is the Arrhenius acid, and calcium hydroxide is the Arrhenius base. Okay, now let me elaborate on more stuff here. Now, to see this, I'm going to do is I'm going to break down all of these into their ions. So, nitric acid, when I put it in solution, will break apart. And notice there's a two in front of the nitric acid. That tells you that there are two nitric acid molecules, okay? And so when I, when I put those in solution, they will break apart to form two protons and two nitrate ions. Everybody see that? Okay. Now, calcium is ionic. All right, it would generate the calcium plus two ion plus two hydroxides. Okay, because there's a subscript two. And then when they react, I I'm going to make, now this is assumed, there's no number, no coefficient in front of calcium hydroxide. So it's assumed that there's one molecule because like mathematics that, no number in front tells you it's one, one molecule of calcium hydroxide, which breaks down to form the respective ions there. The two here tells you that I'm making two molecules of water. Okay, plus I'm making calcium, the salt, calcium nitrate. I got the calcium ion and the nitrate ion, two of them. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm breaking them up into the ions so you can see what is happening with the reaction. All right. Plus, you also, the whole point of this exercise is to show you that you have, we got this balance, the two and the one and the two and the one. Okay, so we have a balanced chemical reaction. So notice that, let me change the color here to this go. So the two protons get together with the two hydroxides, okay, to generate two waters. And then the calcium and the two nitrates get together to generate the calcium and the two nitrates at the end of the reaction. And if you look through all this, you'll find that all the atoms are balanced. We got one calcium ion, one over here. Two nitrates, two nitrates, okay? We have a total of four hydrogens in the beginning with two protons and two hydrogens and hydroxide. So over here, we have a total of four hydrogens in the form of water, two molecules of water, and then two oxygens in the form of hydroxide and two oxygens in the form of water. What we have here is a balanced chemical reaction. Okay. 
which is what we need to learn to start doing because uh, it is crucial when we start doing calculations of these chemical reactions. Okay. Reaction. All right. And we know we got calcium is a plus two, so each nitrate's a negative one. So we need two nitrates to balance out the plus two of the calcium. All right, in this scenario, we're gonna draw pictures of the, uh, the following uh, chemicals. We got HNO3, okay, which is nitric acid. Now, if you go back to your notes, you'll see that nitric acid is a strong acid. Before we can draw anything, we have to define whether something is strong or weak, okay? So it's a strong acid, so guess what? We're gonna get 100% dissociation, okay? HF is gonna be weak. Notice we got that hydrogen in front, so we got a weak acid. So we're gonna get it very low. We're gonna to to maintain maybe only one to 5% dissociation. So we have to show HF combined and then show at least one set of ions in solution. Potassium hydroxide, we have hydroxide tells us we got a base, okay? Question is, is it strong? Well, if we look at our list of strong bases, much better than doing that, is look at the solubility of potassium hydroxide. Potassium belongs to that big four in the first column, which means always soluble. So we have a strong, strong base here. So basically all the ions are in solution, 100%. And then we did this one already, magnesium hydroxide, but we see it's a base, okay? But the solubility rules tell us that it is classified as insoluble, okay? Which means that basically, you know, uh, one to 5% will go in solution and the bulk of it will be as a precipitate at the bottom of the beaker because this is an uh, ionic compound. And because it's ionic, it will be at the bottom of the beaker and it's insoluble. Unlike the covalent acid, which is weak, they will remain in solution, but not drop into the bottom like, like a, a, having a precipitate. Okay, so we've classified the acid and base, whether strong or weak, which just tells us how to write the diagrams, okay? So let's do the first one, all right. So we got nitric acid, which we just defined as a strong acid. That means that we're going to draw it with all the ions separated, okay? Now, you, you don't have to add a lot of ions. You know, three to five sets is more than enough. You know, three is fine. We got three sets here. That's more than enough. Don't forget to add the charges for the particular ions. And because it's a strong acid, none of them are combined. They're all separated, okay? HF, we just defined, is a weak acid. That means that at least have one set of ions in solution, which is the proton and the fluoride. And then the remainder, three to four, whatever you want to put in, are combined and intact. It's an ionic compound, so they're not going to precipitate to the bottom of the beaker. They're going to be floating around in the solution. Okay, So that's what that, this depicts, a weak acid. Um, in solution. Potassium hydroxide, based on the solubility rules down here, I'll show you. Here's a hydroxide, which are normally insoluble when it's combined with any metal, except if they are combined with the big four here in first column and calcium, strontium, and barium. So there are seven examples of the hydroxide ion, uh, so of the hydroxide Seven examples of hydroxide uh, bonded with these seven metals that are soluble. So all those seven would be strong, which means that all the ions will be separated, okay? And so 
uh, one way to look at that is I could replace the potassium with any of these other ions in there. Okay, to demonstrate that particular uh, strong base. And finally, magnesium hydroxide, <coughs> which we looking at the, the solubility rules tells us that it is classified as insoluble. It's an ionic compound. So therefore the bulk of the material falls to the bottom of the beaker, okay? in solid form, and that's what that big chunk of material shows or is trying to show at the bottom of the beaker. But then we show at least one set of ions in solution. So that indicates a weak base. We know it's a weak, we know it's a base because in both, both examples, we are generating hydroxide, okay? So we know these are bases, and we know that uh, potassium hydroxide is strong, because we're showing it all separated, as far as the ions are concerned, and the magnesium is, is a weak base. Okay, because the bulk of the material is down in solution at the bottom of the beaker, and then we have uh, at least one set, in, 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 uh, one set of ions floating around in, in the liquid. We know that the first two were acids because we're generating protons, okay? The first one is a strong acid because all the ions are totally separated. And the second one is a weak acid because the majority of the HFs are still combined, no ions, we put them together, okay? And we have only one set of ions in solution. So that would indicate a weak, weak base. Okay, to summarize this material, we say the arrhenius acid, and by definition, is anything that makes a proton, H plus, in water, okay? It has its own name, proton. Our arrhenius base is any compound that placed in solution uh, produces hydroxide ions. Now, within these two classifications, you can have a strong acid or a weak acid, strong base or a weak base. Okay. Bronson Lowry, you know, similar as far as an acid is concerned, anything that loses a proton. Okay. But where they differ is their definition of a base, and that's any chemical that will gain that proton. Okay. And what that did was uh, open up the number of different compounds that could be classified as bases that had nothing to do at all with being hydroxides. Okay. All right, a strong acid ionizes, breaks up, dissociates, you know, close to 100%, whereas a weak one is much, much less, okay? That's the only difference. Uh, with the base, very similar. The strong base dissociates 100%, whereas a weak base, much, much less. Now, the difference is this here. Question is, how do I know? Well, we gave you for the acids, these are covalent compounds, and we gave you a list. So my, my best suggestion is to just stick with the list, get to know it, and know who's the strong, who's the weak, Acid, okay, but with bases, <clears throat> first of all, we're we're dealing mostly with the hydroxide, so they're they are covalent uh, ionic compounds. So we can use the solubility rules to determine whether it's strong or weak. So any strong base, as defined by the solubility rules of hydroxides, that are that are defined as soluble makes it a strong base. If the rule says insoluble, then it becomes a weak base. Keep it in mind that there is at least one set of ions in solution to, to if you need to draw a diagram. 
but the bulk of this will be down at the bottom of the beaker, okay? All right, and then buffers, their function is just simply to maintain a whatever pH value you need to maintain to keep it constant, okay? And it reacts, if you, got a, if you have a system of a buffer six, you're trying to maintain that pH buffer six, if an acid comes in, excess acid comes in, the base part of that buffer reacts with the acid, or if it's a base coming in, the acid part of that buffer system reacts with the base, the point trying to maintain that constant pH value. <laughs> All right, here's some examples of, uh, of uh, soda pops, very, very, very acidic, yeah. Uh, that tap water, that varies, you know, depends on what part of the country or even what area within the city and who's taking care of your water as far as the pH value. I did have an experiment when I was teaching in, in uh, Missouri. I would have students bring in their water sample, and the students are all came from different areas of the Kansas City area. Some are rural, some are city. And I was, uh, we were flabbergasted with the range of pH value, just tap water. It ranged from very acidic, around three to four, to very alkaline, about eight or nine. Quite, quite the range. Oh, you want to maintain your, maintain your soda pop content down, because these are the things that can happen to your teeth. All right, so. Which brings us to the solubility rules, okay? Um, let's do this. Let's take a quick break. Uh, let's, let's wait 15 minutes. And uh, it's, I got uh, almost two o'clock. Let's come back at 2.15. We'll run through this. If I don't get it knocked out, I'll probably finish it up again in, in the lab on Friday, but I wanna make sure I get it done for you guys. Well, at least for you, Hannah, since you're the one, only one left. <laughs> I know. So I'm like, where did everybody go? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, let's take a, a quick 15-minute break, if you don't mind. Uh, and then uh, uh, we'll not go until we can get as much as we can. Hopefully, we'll finish it. And if not, we'll continue in the lab on Friday. It'll probably be a half an hour or so. Okay? Sound good? Sounds good. Okay, see you in about 50. All right, let's. Okay, you're still here. <laughs> That's good. Well, let us continue. Um, and let's talk about the solubility rules. Okay. I briefly talked about them um, in the uh, previous slides concerning weak bases and so forth. So we're going to go into a little more detail. Okay. Now, these solubility rules are based on a couple of things. One is temperature, because solubility is a function of temp temperature. We know that if we increase the temperature, uh, we are increasing the solubility of some component in an aqueous solution. And that's the other thing. We are talking about uh, uh, the, all of our solubility rules that we'll talk about deal with the solvent of water, aqueous systems. Okay, This also applies for non-aqueous systems, but we're going to keep it to aqueous systems and we're going to keep it at temperature 25 degrees. Right, because things that are classified as insoluble at 25 may be soluble at uh, 75, right? And that varies, so we'll keep it at 25. Also, when something is defined as soluble, that basically means that that compound, which by the way are ionic compounds, will dissociate 100%. And when something is classified as insoluble, that in, tells you that yes, the majority of the material would not be in solution, but uh, there will be some material in solution, ballpark one to 5%, meaning that the rest 95 to 99% would remain intact and therefore being in water will precipitate and drop to the bottom of the container. 
Okay, much like the diagrams we've been we've been showing and talking about earlier. All right, so <clears throat> this is what I just just stated: soluble and insoluble. So here is the table, and it's also found on the periodic table in the bottom right corner, solubility rules. Okay, now there are two columns. Let me clear my stuff up here. We'll go to red. We got th this column right here, which is the soluble column. All right, as I mentioned before earlier, I talked about number one where the cations are these four here, lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonia. What that means is this, when those four are bonded to any other anion, regardless of what it is, it is soluble, okay? Plain and simple, 100% soluble, strong, if it's, a, a, if it's not just ionic compound, no hydroxide involved, It'd be strong electrolytes. Remember, electrolytes are just simply the atoms that have either lost or gained electrons. And so if it's attached to lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium, always soluble. Now, with respect to the anions, okay, if the anion is number two, the acetate anion, and is bonded to any cation, any cation, including the four we just listed, but any cation, it is soluble. So copper acetate, iron acetate, whatever metal acetate, it is uh, soluble. The same is true for number three. All the nitrates are soluble. So lead nitrate, copper nitrate, uh, any metal nitrate is soluble, okay? Number four. When we talk about the halides, specifically chloride, bromide, and iodide. When it is bonded, when those anions are attached to any cation, any metal, it is soluble except, there's three exceptions, except when the halides are bonded to silver, mercury, or lead, aka the heavy metals, okay? When those are when those halides are bonded to those three heavy metals, it is insoluble and actually precipitates at the bottom of the uh, uh, bottom of the beaker, forms a little cloud. Yes, there will be a few ions in solution, but the bulk of the material will be a precipitate. The same is true for number five, the sulfate ion. Again, any cation, any cation that the sulfate is bonded to, it is classified as soluble, except one, two, three, four, five exceptions. And that is when the sulfate is bonded to calcium, or strontium, or barium, or silver, or lead. Those are the five, one, two, three, four, five exceptions of metals that are bonded to the sulfate that make it insoluble. Otherwise, any other metal it's attached to the sulfate ion is classified as um, soluble, okay? All right, now let's focus on the um, other side, which is the insoluble coal. Okay, number one, the carbonate ion. Any cation that's, that's bonded to the carbonate ion is classified as insoluble, except when that cation happens to be the big four. If it's lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium carbonate, they are classified as soluble. Otherwise, everything else is bonded to every other metal is classified as insoluble. And the same is true for the chromate, okay? The chromate, when they are bonded to those four again, they are classified as soluble. And so any other metal the chromate is attached to is classified as insoluble. And guess what? The phosphate, same is true. 
Okay. There's only four examples for these three that are soluble examples. And those, uh, those big four attached to any of those three. Otherwise, all the other thousands of compounds are classified as insoluble and therefore in an aqueous solution will precipitate okay, and drop to the bottom of the container. Normally, the sulfides would follow the same course, meaning that whatever sulfide cap metal is attached to, it is insoluble. And also, those four will make it soluble. But on top of that, we add three more, it, besides the ones in number one, the big four here. But if the sulfide is attached to calcium, strontium, or barium, then those examples are soluble. There's, so there are seven examples of sulfides that are soluble. Lithium sulfide, sodium sulfide, potassium sulfide, ammonium sulfide, calcium sulfide, strontium sulfide, and barium sulfide. Those are soluble. It means that anything else in bonded to is classified as insoluble. <laughs> and a similar uh, aspect about the hydroxide. If those, if the hydroxide is attached to the big four and attached to the calcium or strontium or barium, which again, there's means a total of seven examples of hydroxide compounds that are classified as soluble, that means that everybody else, iron hydroxide would be insoluble. Copper hydroxide, insoluble. Lead hydroxide, insoluble. But strontium hydroxide, soluble. Okay? So that's how it works. So um, the big takeaway here, if you look at number two and three on the left, all the acetate nitrates, literally, it's always 100% soluble. Okay. The others you gotta you have to kind of think about and uh, double check. So let's take a look at um, some examples here. Okay, we got sodium sulfide. Okay, so we're looking at the sulfide number four on the right hand side, but it's attached to sodium. Okay, so that indicates that it is soluble. And we write the AQ designation to demonstrate that it is soluble in an aqueous system. Okay. Now let's take a look at um, aluminum hydroxide. Well, if we look at the aluminum hydroxide, here's a hydroxide. Okay. We find that aluminum is not part of the big four or calcium or strontium or barium. So therefore, it will be classified as insoluble. Okay, so aluminum hydroxide will be insoluble, and we use the letter S to designate that it's a solid and it precipitates. But keep in mind, keep always in mind that if I were drawing a diagram, that I would show some of the ions, one set of ions in solution, while the bulk of the other material would be uh, 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 in a Clunk of material will be in the solid form. Silver bromide. Well, the bromides is number four. Okay. So I'm looking at bromide right here. All right. And normally bromides are soluble, but it's attached to silver. So therefore, it is classified as insoluble. Okay. And then we got the calcium carbonate. So we look for the carbonate. Let me clear a little bit of a mess here. Carbonate's right here, number one. Okay. Normally everything is uh, insoluble with carbonate, uh, unless it's the big four, but calcium is not the big four. And therefore, it is insoluble. In fact, you find a lot of the, uh, you see a lot of gunk around the, uh, say, your water faucet, that white material. That's what you're probably, probably looking at as some calcium carbonate, which is insoluble. And then potassium, the fact that you see potassium right up top, nothing else doesn't make, 
you don't have to go any further because automatically the fact that you see potassium tells you right here, bam, it's always soluble. So that would always be 100% soluble, okay? And if I were to be drawing uh, beaker diagrams, um, I would, uh, give me very quickly, for sodium uh, sodium sulfide, if I were drawing diagrams, you know, I would have two sodiums in solution and the sulfides in solution, all in solution. With aluminum hydroxide, because it's insoluble, there's going to be some uh, aluminum, the majority of aluminum hydroxide in the bottom, and then it will be at least one set of ions in solution. Same is true for silver bromide. Silver bromide is insoluble. So the bulk of it be down at the bottom, but I, I need to show at least one set of halides, uh, excuse me, um, ions in solution. And same is true for calcium carbonate at the bottom, and then one set of ions in solution to demonstrate that yes, there's a little bit, and then potassium chloride, totally all in solution, okay? All right. So with respect to ele electrolytes, you know, strong electrolytes, <coughs> they're nothing more than just uh, the ions in solution. So as strong electrolytes are any ionic compound that's soluble uh, based on the solubility rules, strong acids, strong bases, some examples there would be potassium bromide, because potassium, any, remember number one on the left-hand side of the solubility table, any potassium, whatever it's bonded to, is always soluble. So there are some examples of strong electrolytes, okay? Non-electrolytes, these are covalent compounds other than acids that when put in solution, do not dissociate. They don't make ions. So other than acids that are covalent compounds, all covalent compounds are non-electrolytes. They do not conduct electricity. Okay, so water, carbon monoxide. Notice that C6H12O6, you may not know what that is. That's okay. But you can see that there's no hydrogen in front. So there's no, no that isn't normally like a state. It normally indicates an acid. That's not possible. That an acid wouldn't be there. So the fact that it just starts with carbon and then followed by everything else tells you I'm dealing with a, a, a ionic, excuse me, covalent compound and therefore non electrolyte. The weak electrolytes, those are the things like the weak acid, the weak base, okay, or any compound, ionic compound that, as per the solubility rules, are insoluble, uh, meaning that. In solution, the bulk of the material is still intact, but there are a few ions floating around in solution, not as many as a strong electrolyte, but they're there. And so here's some uh, kind of summarizes all that, okay, strong electrolytes. And if we were using a, uh, a uh, conductor to measure the conductivity, if something conducts, a solution conducts electricity, then you would have ions shown here in the beaker on top. And uh, that conduct, that electricity will carry through, close that circuit and to light up whatever, maybe get a light bulb up there to demonstrate. And if you remember our, in the lab, we did that conductivity experiment. If something conducted, it would light up that little LED light. If it's not conducted like an electrolyte, then the circuit is uh, closed and there's no electricity passing from point A to point B, okay? Um, images, they're asking here, which is strong, weak, or nine? Well, if we look at the first picture here, you can see we got a junk of material down at the bottom, okay? Very quickly indicates that this has got to be a weak electrolyte. More specifically, it is a weak base because you got hydroxide in the solution. So we got a weak base here. 
based on the solubility of the magnesium hydroxide that we verified in the solubility rules and showed that it's insoluble. Um, the one in the middle, the fact that you got nothing but carbon and hydrogens would tell you it's a hydrocarbon. And so this is a covalent compound. So if we were to put some in solution, they would not dissociate. So this would be a non-electrolyte. To, to conduct electricity, there's gonna be charges in solution to, to conduct and close that circuit, okay? And potassium chloride, the fact that potassium is written first, again, part of the big four, if you will, that potassium, whatever is bonded to, always is soluble, meaning that all this, excuse me, all these are ions. So this would be a strong, strong electrolyte. Okay. All right. What we can do here is uh, we classify each as a strong, weak, or non-electrolyte, okay? If we look at barium sulfide, we have barium sulfide, meaning we got a ionic compound, okay? And then we can look up the solubility rules of it, and it will tell us whether it's strong or weak based on the solubility, okay? so. If we do that, we see that it is a strong electrolyte because it is classified as soluble in water, okay? Silver chloride, normally halides are soluble based on the solubility rules. First identify it as an ionic compound, which then sends us to the solubility table, okay? And then from there, determine soluble or insoluble, and it says that it's insoluble, so therefore, it is a weak electrolyte because it is classified as being insoluble. Potassium nitrate. Potassium is the first thing you see automatically based on solubility rules, it's strong because those big four, the very first one, number one, uh, those first uh, four cations, whatever is bonded to them, always 100% soluble. H2CO3, that's carbonic acid. That is one of the acids that we talked about earlier, which uh, unfortunately just have to identify as a weak acid, okay? It is a weak acid. And carbon and dioxide. Well, carbon and oxygen, it, it's a covalent compound. It's not gonna dissociate. So it is a non-electrolyte, okay? Because it's covalent. And then find number six, you have sodium. Boom, just like potassium, automatically sends you the solubility table. It tells you part of the four. So whatever follows doesn't make any difference. The fact you get the sodium ion there tells you it is soluble, therefore making it a strong electrolyte slash base because you got hydroxide. Okay. Calcium carbonate, based on the solubility rules, it is weak because it's classified as being insoluble. And then here we have number eight, which is uh, basically a, a covalent compound of sorts. It's all carbon, hydrogen, and some oxygen. There's no hydrogens up front to indicate possibly an acid. So it is a non-electrolyte, okay? Because it is covalent. Sodium number nine, automatically, automatically because sodium is strong strong electrolyte because of solubility. Uh, a good hint for number 10, when you see those big metals, silver, mercury, uh, and lead, uh, that's normally a good indication you're dealing with a, a insoluble material. So you go verify it with the solubility rules and you find it to be insoluble because again, in, it is classified as insoluble based on the solubility rules. And that, Sorry, I went over one minute of your time. It brings us to the end. Okay. Perfect timing and the per chapter. Yeah, perfect timing. All right. So uh, we don't have to continue this on Friday. We're good to go. And 